Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, be beloveds, there is still much work to be done. I'm Pam Wakeman, and I am a member of the LBGTA Welcoming Con Congregation Committee at our church in Lincoln, Nebraska, the Unitarian Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. The chalice lighting this morning is titled A Protest and a Party by Hannah Roberts Villeneuve. People sometimes ask, is pride a protest or a party? And the answer is, of course, yes. And why not? Why not rejoice as we resist, dance as we demand change, celebrate as we create community that delights in all of who we are? So bring all of that with you this morning. Bring your policy demands, bring your glitter, bring your Supreme Court broken heart, bring your rainbow socks, bring the emptiness you feel for our siblings gone too soon. Bring your Gloria Estefan remix, bring your tender hope for change, Bring your most garish eyeshadow. Bring your spirit tattered and battered by a world that seems insistent on choosing fear and hate. Gather up these things and bring them here to a place where we don't have to shoulder these burdens or celebrate these joys alone. Come, let's worship together. Our story today is called Love is Love, and it's by Michael Genhart. I've got a problem. Today, some kids were laughing at my shirt. They were teasing me for wearing it. One of the kids said my shirt was gay. My friend asked, what does that mean? I wasn't sure, but I think it's because I have two dads. I told my friend, I don't like it when kids say that being gay is gross, or they say, that's so gay when they don't like something. Some of the kids even say my family wasn't a real family. That's just mean and it hurts. My friend told me maybe I shouldn't wear the shirt, but that doesn't seem fair. I wonder why some people think that I shouldn't have two dads. Why would they think being gay is wrong? Maybe because being different is scary to some people, but my dads really love each other. Just like my friend's mom and dad love each other. This isn't different. My dad's got married on a mountaintop wearing skis. My friend's mom and dad got married on a beach wearing bathing suits. And my dad's love me very much, just like my friend's mom and dad love her. We both have families who love us. That's not so different either. I know lots of other gay people too. My teacher, Mrs. Adams is gay. Police Chief Carter is gay too. 
And my sister's coach is gay. Mayor Sanchez is also gay. There are even lots of famous gay people, singers and scientists and art artists and athletes. My friend thinks we might even have a gay president one day. But some people believe being gay is something to be ashamed of. My dad's told me that some gay people even try to pretend that they aren't gay. My dad said that no one should be ashamed of who they are. That's why this shirt is so special. My dad's gave it to me and I feel proud wearing it. I love my dads and they love me. We're not so different from any other family and I'm not embarrassed about who we are. So when some kids say, your dads are gay, I'll just say, yes, they are. And when some kids say, you're not a real family, I'll just say, yes, we are. My dads love me and I love my dads and that's what really matters. And I'm proud to be a part of my family. Love is the same wherever you live, whoever you are and whomever you love. Love is love. And that is the end of our story. Good morning. My name is Craig Immig, and I have been a part of this community for about three years. I believe compassionate inclusiveness of diverse people relates to the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, specifically the first three, which are the inherent worth and dignity of every person, two, justice and com equity and compassion in human relations, and three, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. And I believe that this relates to the golden rules, such as mentioned in the Christian Bible, which are do to others what you would want them to do to you, and love your neighbor as yourself. If I was gay, I would not want to be mistreated because I was gay, and I would want to be free to legally marry another gay person if I chose. Today this is possible, but not long ago. Same-sex marriage was not legally recognized. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln has had a long history of welcoming and affirming same-sex relationships. In 1981, the Reverend Charles Stephen, who was the minister of the church at, at this time, that time, conducted a wedding of two men. As reported in the Lincoln Journal Star newspaper at the time, like other couples married the Unitarian Church, they prepared their own ceremony from a marriage handbook and materials supplied by Reverend Stephen. The ceremony was very sacred between the two of us, one of the men said. They say most people, either out of prejudice or ignorance, don't understand the whole concept of homosexuality. But why care about who loves me? If everyone loved one another for what they are, the world would be a lot nicer place. I am proud of the man I love, and I deserve the chance to love that person. I really like how he said that. In 1985, the organization called Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, or PFLAG, was established in Nebraska. The Unitarian Church was the only place they could find that welcomed them in so they could meet and have their events. At the time, PFLAG had already been going for about five years in other parts of the country. Barbara Kimberly was part of the national group before the, the Lincoln One began, and she was involved in it. And the first president was Jean Eileen Durgan Clinchard. B.J. Wheeler, who joined the church in 1985, and is still active with the welcoming committee, and Lois Hansen were also heavily involved in the beginning of the group. It was the first chapter of PFLAG in Nebraska. Some of the things PFLAG did was show educational videos, they had movie nights at the church and relate, that relate to same-sex issues, and they had potlucks once a month uh, with games after people had dinner. There are also support groups that were held once a month. Today, PFLAG is still going, and for more information about their current activities, their website is pflaglincoln.org, and their phone number is 402-219-3923. 
Start about 25 years ago, the LGBTQA plus welcoming community has put on and participated in a variety of activities. There were two votes of the congregation because there were not enough votes to get it approved the first time. They became the church sponsor of P the PFLAG meetings that were held at the church, and they were in charge of two of our worship services a year focused, that focused on sexuality and gender issues. Uh, they had coffee house, house night uh, started about 10 years ago. The original idea was that people who were coming out needed a place where they could feel safe about meeting others uh, who may have had similar experiences and they could be joined by straight people who would be accepting of them. Every year they've been involved in the Lincoln City Pride events, including having an information table there and games for kids. They also had, have had information tables at the University of Nebraska's Big Red Welcome event, and they displayed the National AIDS quilt. They um, sponsored um, the Living Better conferences in which they invited experts on various subjects to present workshops such, a, uh, such as buying a house and other topics. They were awarded a grant to help them uh, pay for the conferences. They began in 2005 and they were held every two years. Currently, the committee maintains a comprehensive web page that is accessible from the church website. Due to the pandemic, the the game night was moved online and people have been playing games in fun new ways with an app called Jackbox. That is after a time for socializing, of course. And some folks who join the games have learned about this, um, have learned about for through the organization called Out Nebraska. The game night happens on the fourth Friday of every month and with the next one being on March 26th. Thank you for listening and have a gay day. Each week, whether in person or online, we pass the offering plate to support the work of this church. If you would like to give an offering, you may do so now online or through text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln space and the amount to 73256. These instructions are also in the chat box to the right of this video. We passed a difficult marker this week. Over 500,000 Americans have died now from COVID-19. Half a million people in a year. 500,000 stories. There's a weight to this, that even if we don't talk about every day, we certainly feel, I know I feel it. 
And right now we're also coming up on a lot of one year anniversaries and those can be heavy, difficult times as well. So I hope, my ask, is that we be gentle with ourselves and each other. These are not normal times that we're living in. And it is okay if you're not okay right now. That's what the church is here for. To gather in community, to support each other, to be a presence and a witness in moments like this. The other marker that we passed as a country this week was, fi was 50 million vaccinations. And there's still a long way to go, but it's a reminder that as the psalm teaches, sorrow endures for the night, but joy cometh with the dawn. Every day for the last few weeks, I've woken up and immediately pulled out my phone to see who on Facebook, who of the people that I love have gotten vaccinations that day. Old friends, family members, beloved members of the congregation. And each of those little notes is a reminder that dawn comes, that joy is just as much a part of life as grief. So as this next song plays, a song of celebration and commitment written in a moment of terrible grief, we invite you to share your name or the name of someone you are carrying in your heart this morning in the chat box. Thank you for your presence. Michelle Howard, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. 
And I'm Heather Fox and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions by Victoria E. Safford? People ask me sometimes, is this a gay church? Is it a privilege to answer? Ours is absolutely gladly, hopefully, humbly, gaily, a gay church. A gay tradition where everyone, including heterosexual members and friends, is welcome, where uh, everyone is needed, where everyone experiences a cherish as a sacred task because no one experiences of living or loving can be comfortable. Comprehensive because each of us holds clues the others need about how to live with dignity and joy as a human person, and none of us knows enough about what yet to be considered whole. <laughs> it, is ab- it is absolutely a gay church, even as ours is a gay world. If you would look around, gay churches, straight churches, people's churches, a human congregation made holy by the holy hopes and fears and dreams of all who wish to come. Come in, we say. Come out. Come in. We're all in this together. I will not speak of tolerance, which is theosity, clenched teeth, and better and bitter resignation. I will not speak about acceptance of other people and some other kind of lifestyle. I can only look in laughing and wonder at human life is all inaugurations i can taste only in passing the breath of the spirit of my mouth and understand our common longing in deep deep gulfs of it i cannot think of being anybody else alley and even because even that implies some degree of separation some degree of safety for some of us not all we are allied with no one and with nothing but love the larger love transiting all of our understanding within which all the different, different gorgeously, very, very beautiful, divine aspects of ourselves, which all the different gorgeous and very, very beautiful, divine aspects are, aspects of ourselves are bond, elegant unity. I know that on some sad and disappointing days, these words describe the church that shall be and not the church that is. I know, I know, but I know too that to answer is an act of creation. To answer this question and some others is a privilege, a prophetic imperative, a joy, a duty, a holy sacrament. So we're gonna try something different this Sunday. Changing the form once again. If you've been watching the daily updates while I've been here in New York the last two months, you'll recognize what we're doing right now and where we are. I'm up on the Finger Lakes Trail just outside of Dryden, New York, where we've been staying for the last two months. This is actually where I've been recording all the updates for this week, right down that trail. But it's also, while I've got some time, and I'm thinking about Sunday, I'm going to talk for a little bit about being a welcoming congregation. The LGBTQA Welcoming Committee reached out to me at the beginning of this congregational year, expressing a desire to recertify our congregation is a welcoming congregation with the UUA. Now, the welcoming congregation program at the UUA started decades ago as a way to make sure that our congregations were welcoming to gay and lesbian congregants, visitors, staff, and clergy. And that program was a huge success. So much so that now, if you look up Unitarian Universalist churches, most all of them have a little welcoming 
logo on their website. Welcoming, I suppose, was our way of framing that in a way of not saying what this was really about, and that's true of churches across. You sometimes see churches labeled as open and affirming, or churches labeled as reconciling, Christian churches. What that is, is the church saying we are friendly to gay and lesbian folks. But about five years ago, folks at the UUA and in UU churches started to really look at the welcoming congregation curriculum that's existed for several decades now and say, you know, this isn't actually what we want to be saying right now. A lot has changed in the decades since the Welcoming Congregation packet was written the first time. Just for a, a quick for instance, it's our practice on Zoom meetings now to put our pronouns in after our name. And just about every word of that sentence from our pronouns to Zoom meetings would have felt outside the scope of the original authors of the Welcoming Congregation's work. So, five or six years ago, they started a program of updating the Welcoming Curriculum to better fit this moment and the needs of our congregations now. And that's what we're doing this year. In a moment, I'll bring in some other voices from the congregation, members of our LGBTQA welcoming committee to talk through their experience of what welcoming means in this congregation. But as we do, before we do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the five pillars of welcome that the UUA identifies as being part of being a welcoming congregation in 2021. Ah, I'm gonna do so while sitting in this beautiful place. So the five pillars of welcome begin with the simplest. That this congregation certified as a welcoming congregation the first time, which we have done. We have fulfilled that pillar. That's important work to do for any congregation because insofar as this is a, a supplement to things that we've done for decades, we really need that grounding of work of decades to do it. You know, if folks are coming to us or if congregations are wanting to participate who haven't done any work on welcoming folks of diverse gender identity and sexualities, then that's a different starting point from where the welcoming recertification assumes that we are. The second pillar, and I apologize if I get these in the wrong order, I'm actually up in the North Woods, uh, as you can see, and I have no cell service right now, so I'm doing these uh, from memory, so they may not be in the right order. And because we're walking along a path, uh, reordering them in post-production will be a little bit harder. The second pillar is that congregations incorporate welcoming into their worship services, both broadly across worship services, but also in at least a couple specific worship services over the course of the year. These could be anything from a transgender day of remembrance that happens on November 19th to this service that we're doing today, really highlighting what this is and why it's important. The next pillar is that the congregation recognizes days of remembrance, days of 
importance on the calendar for the LGBTQA community. And this one's a little nebulous. This one is the one that feels the most like checking a box when we're actually doing it, and the most like a piece of culture when we're doing it automatically. Because these day days range from National Coming Out Day to the Transgender Day of Remembrance to World AIDS Day in December to Bi Awareness Day. All of these are important days of commemoration. And so part of the recertification process is simply to recognize when they come about on the calendar. That's three. The fourth pillar is education. We'll walk for this one. Because edu education is a mobile process. Part of the work of welcoming congregations is recognizing that our work is almost never done in this area and in all areas where we're building the beloved community. So the pillar of education is saying this, that congregations, in order to be doing, to be calling themselves welcoming congregations, really need to be doing, at least annually, some kind of educational program to really continue the work of continually asking ourselves how can we be more welcoming? In our parlance at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, this looks like an adult religious education program. The committee has been working on them over the last month. You've probably seen them in the e-blast. And we're going to do more of them. This is really just an organized way of answering questions that come up all the time. Why are we putting pronouns next to our Zoom names now. What does it mean to be welcoming in the moment when a visitor steps through our doors? What are the needs of the trans community here in Lincoln? All these things are a piece of the education pillar. And then the last pillar for welcoming recertification is a request that congregations participate in some kind of large-scale project, either through volunteer hours or donations, or probably both. And this is a recognition that this work of being a Welcoming congregation is not simply confined to our community, to our little 300 people at 6300 A Street. But it is dependent on how we interact with the community around us, how the community around us perceives us. Because if we think we're welcoming and nobody in Lincoln knows who we are, and nobody in Lincoln thinks that we're welcoming, then we're not. We're just not. So this last pillar is about that piece, about recognizing that this is about more than just us. Those are the pillars. I'll let Michelle and Shelley and Heather talk about their experience of welcoming in a moment here. But I do, I suppose also, I'll say a little bit about what it means to me. Because this matters, right? As a straight white guy, it matters how we think of, how I think of my role in welcoming. How it doesn't actually just become the province of another committee of the church, 
but it is something that all of us in the congregation, even those of us with fully majority identities own and take part in. Welcoming everybody is what makes us universalist. That's the not particularly complicated preacher answer to this. Our theological forebears said that everybody, everybody, without exception, ever, is beloved of God. And that is a simple statement. And so for me, as we talk about beloved community all this month, we've talked about the church being a sign and foretaste of the beloved community, right? A sign of what is to come, a place where we practice the divine in life here. And if the thing that we are a sign and foretaste of is that everybody, everybody without exception ever, anywhere, is beloved of the divine. (laughs) Then we better practice that in our congregations. There are more complicated pieces to it. There are pieces that say, I think everybody deserves a religious home. And I think it's the great failure of the institutional church in the 20th century that it failed to be. But ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Do we see everybody without exception? as beloved of God, or beloved of the universe, or beloved of us, however you frame that theological point. The important universalist point is the belovedness. All right, I'm almost back at the car. And I'm not actually the most important voice today. So I'll turn things over to Heather Fox and the LGBTQA Welcoming Committee. So I'm Heather Fox and I'm a member here at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln and I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. And I'm I'm also a member of the LGBTQA Welcoming Committee. Yes, my name is Shelley. And my pronouns are they or she. Okay, my um, my name is Michelle Howard. I use she, her, and or pronouns. So, and I just started uh, no, about not too long ago with the church. So, so for, first, I'll say thank you so much for for joining us um, in in worship this morning as we explore this work of the the five pillars of welcome and the work that the LGBTQA Welcoming Committee is doing um, this year. And so I just want to start out by by asking, uh, tell us about the the work that the committee has going on this year. Yeah. Well, in general, our work is to create a welcoming environment for all LGBTQA plus um, people in our congregation and the greater community and to look out for the rights of each individual. And so that's that's what our main work is um, over time and always has been. This year, it's particularly interesting because we get to participate in the um, welcoming congregation renewal. If we could just start by looking at the old website, and I know it's going to change, but um, the 
part that is most important to me is that bar that says we are. Mm -hmm. We are accessible. We're a welcoming congregation. We're a green sanctuary, sanctu sanctuary, and we're gender neutral. It says a lot right there in that bar. What does us being a welcoming congregation mean to you? There's not a lot of there's not a lot of folks that are specifically like me at our church right now. Maybe a little bit more and more, but I'm <laughs> I'm a really old person who's just finally figuring herself themselves out and I'm really turning to the young people to help me, you know, figure out my pronouns and figure out the words that, you know, I, I haven't yet found exactly the right terminology I, I want to use for myself. So mm -hmm. I like to learn more about everybody else so that I can see what works for me. That's really interesting because you're describing what's on on one hand intensely personal work, thinking about our, our identity, but in a through community, through interacting with other people. Yeah, because I've said this in many different meetings and situations before, but I would never. I'm good. I always get verklempt when I try to say this. I would never have had the balls to come out to my parents to to be who I am or reach more towards who I am if it wasn't for this church feeling welcome and accepted has really helped me grow into myself. And however else that I could help other people find themselves, and especially for me, and it's the children. You know, I have those dolls that are non-gender, and I, I found a class online talking about how to help children learn about what gender they feel. Because, yeah. you know, 55, it, you know, is way too old to, <laughs> I feel like it's way too old to finally figure stuff out. But if other people, if I can help other people figure stuff out earlier, right. that would be nice. There's some of us who have been pretty welcomed into a lot of environments. And so um, a handshake and a hello and maybe a use of our name will make us feel as welcome as needed. And then there's others of us who haven't been welcomed into churches or our own homes or um, other places, schools. And so that needs a little bit more intentionality. And we need to be a little bit, well, not just a little bit, we need to be more intentional about it and careful about the ways that we show our, our open arms. And, that is, that's what we're trying to do as a welcoming committee. And what I hope that this renewal practice does is just to help us relook at the ways that we are a welcoming congregation too. What, what would you like people to know um, about, as they're, as they're thinking about this service and they're thinking about what it means for, for us to be a welcoming congregation um uh what what should what should people know about that work well yeah just to feel warm and welcome and inside and so that's the way i felt i felt uh, supportive very supportive and warm and welcoming inside when i first joined so and in my my recollection is you you started joining us after after we had moved out of our building a year ago. Is that yeah I think I can yep. 
I think I filmed that form and Kelly answered me back on that on the on the form and stuff. And I just finished her uh, starting point class like last week, I think. So made it through that. So, how was uh, how was starting point? Real interesting. I liked it. Real good. She's a good teacher. I like Kelly. She's a real good teacher. So, so do you want to talk a little bit about what this? what this particular renewal process looks like? Sure. Yeah. Um, for me, I, um, I'm i just taking it as a time to reconsider the ways that we welcome mm-hmm. and a real refocus back on the issues. Because if I look at the five practices of a welcoming renewal, they seem like they're um, checking off the boxes, just doing these things because it's an application, we want to get it done. And um, our our committee doesn't want to approach it that way, and I don't think the church does either. So these are the five practices, and then let's we want to talk with the congregation about how they look in real life and how we can use them to better our welcome. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So those I'm going to go ahead and stop the share on this because those are all the images that I have. But I did want to mention this little bit about some of the the hymns that we sing Mm -hmm. if you don't mind (laughs) so (laughs) one of them is welcome rejoice and come in i think it's hymn number uh 361 is that right yeah and to rejoice and come in Mm -hmm. and i actually have been singing it wrong most of the time i sing it welcome rejoice and come in along with everyone else and no one really notices. Right. But, um, that, that hymn for me says we're welcoming. It just doesn't tell us, tell people who we are welcoming. What else do you want the congregation to know as part of this work? That we are attracting people and sometimes new people do just want to check it out without talking to everybody the first time they come or the second time they come. And I, I, I do think maybe we have to, we need to be a little bit more careful when some of my Brown family members come, or if, if a, a out gay person comes, you know, we we seem sometimes to tend to cluster around the different to try to welcome the different. Uh, but we we obviously we need to welcome everyone, like you said earlier. Everybody means everybody. But what we can change in our own everyday life, or as we speak to large groups of people is um, the language we use to make sure that folks feel included. You yeah. know, and those are, they're simple. And then they're also, it's also complex, but you know, using, using partner instead of husband or wife, um, using family instead of mom, dad, and then being so um honest and careful about calling people by the names that they want to be called by and the pronouns that they want to use. Mm -hmm. And those are things that each one of us can do. Yeah. Yeah. Each one of us can do it and we can, we can be, we can grow our skill of being non-defensive when we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's a big piece of it for folks who look like me, you know, straight white guys. Um, often, often we get it wrong, and so so a, a skill that's important is to be able to say, "Oh, okay," mm-hmm. and then get it right the next time. Like just to acknowledge the mistake and then get it right. Uh, I know back in my 
my pre-seminary days, I'd go and visit a church and I would occasionally just like turn around and walk out if too many people talked to me at coffee hour. <laughs> I a died in the wool introvert and um, yeah, that can be a very difficult interaction. Right. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to tell you one more little thing. Um, it's kind of related, but it's just kind of something I want you to know. Um, I'm taking this year long creativity class called Heartwork Journaling University. Mm -hmm. And the church actually helped me pay for it, um, which I, I, I did pay forward back to the fund already. Um, but it's a whole year long and it's the, uh, not beta version, but, oh, I'm not an alumni. I'm, I'm part of the first group of people going through this university. And this lady is a, uh, an artist and a life coach, which I don't even really know what a life coach is. But this is a really good class where we're working through emotions and figuring out emotions through art. And she asked us, since she calls it a university, she asked us to each come up with a major that we'll be working on throughout the whole year. And my major is be authentic, trust yourself. And so that's, that's what I'm personally working on this year through that class. But there again, that's something I wouldn't have been able to do if it wasn't for the help of the church. What does it mean to be authentic and trust yourself day to day life? Well, that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's only month two. I'm, I'm, it, it's hard. I, I ask myself self that every, you know, it, am I being authentic when I say this? Am I being authentic? Is this what I really mean? Is this what I, is this how I really feel? Right. There's just so many years of being a good girl or, you know, cross your legs like a lady, all that malarkey ingrained in my brain that I'm having to sort through it all to find the authentic part of myself. But I'm working on it. I'm getting there. Yeah. Well, that's a really exciting project to work on, too, is to what is the core of who we are outside of all these yeah. pieces that we get clumped onto? Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I know yeah. it's, uh, it's cold in Nebraska right now. <laughs> Not the easiest day, um, but I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Anything Thank anything you else? With me. Yeah, anything else you want to chat about outside the service? Oh, not that I can think of. My I I can't with this cold cold air, coldness. I can't tell if I'm getting a cold or if it's just like I have bad sinuses, so my sinuses react to the frozen temperatures. But I, I feel kind of sick right now, so my brain is not processing on all my cylinders. Sure. <laughs> well, if you ever want to chat, if you ever want to touch base outside of any program, just let me know. I'm around. Okay. I spend, I spend most uh, of my days sitting in this chair on Zoom. But... <laughs> <laughs> Would you be interested in seeing any of the artwork that I have been doing in my class? Absolutely. Just... Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I really miss seeing your artwork and your projects with the kids. I. <sighs> Ailish is just old enough yeah. that she's figured out arts and crafts and I am looking forward to, to, 
reintroducing the two of you. Yeah, it's a it's hard, but we're gonna get through it. Yeah, closer to the end than the beginning now, I think. I hope. It's really good to see you. Me too. Take care of yourself. You too. Thank you. Hugs to your family. Will do. What do you want the what do you want the congregation to come away from this service and these series of classes you're doing? What do you want folks who hear it to to leave thinking about? Well, I would like people to know how grateful grateful I am for a place like the Unitarian Church, how grateful so many of us are for folks who are continuing to learn and try and care about the perspectives of others. It's a wonderful feeling to know that people are always growing and always learning here. So gratitude on top of the, I, that's the highest message, I guess. And then the, the next piece would be just um, if there's questions or need for understanding or wanting to be more involved but not knowing how, maybe these courses can help um, people answer some of those questions or get more involved. Right. If, if a congregant is, is hearing this and says, this is fascinating, I want to get more involved, mm -hmm. where, where do they go? Who do they, who do they reach out to? Mm -hmm. Well, they can reach out to any of us on the committee. My name's on the contact, so definitely email me if you'd like to be involved. And know that the LGBTQA Welcoming Committee, it's not just for people who are gay or transgender or queer or um, whatever we may, we may be. It's for all of us. We have quite a few allies on in that group as well. And everyone is welcome to attend one meeting or every meeting. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen. See you next Sunday. Back in seminary, I learned about John Wesley not having places, churches to preach in, and so John Wesley going out into a field and preaching to whatever birds, bees, and factory workers would come past his field and listen to him. 
<laughs> this is uh, one of the more memorable settings for giving a sermon that I've ever done. It's very, very quiet out here. All right. <laughs> 